Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is one of the most familiar faces here on DW. Here he is, in person of course, Brent Goff. Hello Peter. Brent, great to have you here on Talking good Germany. To be here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting to have this man in my studio with me. Now, Brent is one of uh, our main anchors, of course, on the DW News format, The Journal. He's also these days got his own talk show, which is called Agenda. He hails originally from the southern states of the US, and I know that he's uh, something of an authority on the whole process of news broadcasting and dif the different approaches that are taken in North America on the one hand and here in Europe and specifically Germany on the other. And I'm sure it's going to be very interesting to hear what he has to say on that and the following topics. Old friends, new tensions. Berlin and Washington have been very close allies since World War II, so why are some asking what's gone wrong with US-German relations? Expertise on the cheap. A growing number of universities and colleges are using visiting lecturers and professors to cut costs. Brent can tell us more. Lean and mean Brent, like many Americans, has a personal trainer to keep him fit. And many Germans are these days following his example. <laughs> Brent, you're, titter you're tittering. Yeah, I'm laughing at the personal <laughs> trainer point. Yeah. We'll get that later. Yeah. yeah. OK, well, we're going to begin with, um, I was just mentioning the, uh, the special relationship, which it undoubtedly is between Washington and Berlin. We're going to talk about the ups and downs of that relationship very shortly. But first of all, this question, Brent Goff and Germany, a special relationship? Mm, it's mm. a very good question, <laughs> yeah. It, um, it is one. Uh, I, I think if you had met me when I was a teenager and, and said you're going to spend um, a significant part of your adult life in Germany, I would have said, you, you know, you're, you're crazy. I mean, where are you getting that from? Um, but it happened that way. And um, I have to say that now I would really call Berlin, Berlin. In Germany, Berlin. You're being very cautious. My chosen home. <laughs> yeah, because Berlin is like New York. Uh, Berlin is not Germany. New York is not the United States. So we're not talking about Germany here. We're talking, yeah, we're talking about yeah. Berlin. I mean, we have Special to... relationship, Brent Goff, uh, <clears throat> Berlin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, this is a place where I think as, as a foreigner, you can quickly find a niche and feel at home. Mm. Um, the same way it would be in New York. And, and, and I do that. I, I, I rarely now feel like I'm, I'm a foreigner. Um, and I think that, that speaks to the, the ability of Berlin to welcome um, so many different people into one place. Okay. You've been, you've been here in Berlin for, for a lot. How, how long? Exactly? Since 1999. Okay. Uh, you've been working at DWTV for well over a decade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What makes DWTV for you? What makes DW yeah, so special? It is something that, um, as an American, we have luxuries here that I never had working in television in the United States. Um, we, uh, we have a, an amount of security when it comes to funding. Um, we are able to spend a reasonable amount of time on researching, writing, reporting, putting stories together. And as you know, because you and I, we've, we've been at the same anchor desk many times. Mm -hmm. When you do a newscast, when we do journal, um, the journal, uh, we are able to do news in a, in a very big block without commercials. And we are delivering pure news content. And in the United States, you know, my, I've got tons of colleagues in the States, and um, they'll watch journal and they'll say, gosh, you guys are so lucky. You don't have to break up everything into these blocks, you know, and then have commercials in between. We don't have to do that here. It, it is a luxury. A luxury and a great thing too. Uh, that, some interesting initial impressions there from Brent. Let's get a little bit more now. Linking up to the world from Berlin. Final preparations before going on air. For more than 10 years, Brent Goff has been presenting the journal on Deutsche Welle Television. You're watching The Journal here on EWTV. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. The 39-year-old journalist is the voice and face of the station's English-language news program. What did we see in Strasbourg today? And his work continues when the cameras have been turned off. During each shift, he has to prepare and present five news shows. He writes his own copy. News is a fast-moving and stressful business. To counteract the stress, he works out three times a week and cycles to and from work, whatever the weather. Brent Goff was born in 1972 in Wilson, North Carolina in the U.S. 
Kentucky won a scholarship to a boarding school for gifted pupils. Among his subjects was German. In the early 1990s, he got to know the language better during 10 months studying in Saarbrücken. Back home in the States, he worked as a reporter and anchor for major news broadcasters ABC and CNN. Board tonight is definitely not the night to drink and drive more than After the Berlin Wall fell, he reported live from the city. And his first interview in Germany was with a political heavyweight, former Chancellor Helmut Kohl. As a Fulbright scholar, he lectured in journalism in Hamburg, and he worked for a time at the German networks ARD and RTL before moving to Deutsche Welle. Germany is simply always on his mind. And today, he's our guest on Talking Germany, Brent Goff. Looking very relaxed there, Brent. Yeah. Uh, the sweater. I know. Horrible, right? God, you, you have to tell your producers to be a little bit more generous when they're picking their cuts there. Um, you were born in Wilson, North yes. Carolina. Yes. Is, that, is that where you spent your first years there? As I well? did, yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. My research tells me it's a city of beautiful trees. Oh, it does have trees, yes. <laughs> yeah. The trees are beautiful, yeah. It is actually, it is. I mean, it's not a big city. I think the population is about 80,000. Um, but, but it's a lovely place. It's a great place to raise a family. Um, and growing up there, I mean, I had, you know, an, an idyllic childhood um, mm -hmm. there and can't complain at all. And the weather's great. You know, we talk about how bad the winters are here in Berlin. The winters in North Carolina, very mild. Um, and yeah, people love living there. Your granddad was a tobacco farmer. He was, yeah. yeah. The, the whole family was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, was was any of that still going on when, when, when you were growing up? <clears throat> no, my grandfather decided to get out of it and he decided to just lease the land to other farmers. He opened up a general store oh. in um, his later years uh, just for fun. And that is where I spent a lot of my time. I would get off the school bus, first grade, second grade, mm -hmm. and spend the afternoons with my grandparents in their general store. Lovely. And, and you, you can yeah. just imagine sitting there and <laughs> all these farmers with, with the workers and just people driving by stopping to, mm -hmm. to get a drink or whatever mm -hmm. and, and chatting. And I would hear about everything that was going on in the neighborhood. And um, it was a life or a lesson in learning how adults think. In learning how adults, adults think. think. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> exactly. And then you went off to a residential <clears throat> school for highly talented youngsters. Yeah. yeah um, there, North Carolina was the first state in the United States to publicly flaunt, fund a residential high school for academically gifted students. Mm -hmm. And um, usually, you know, you would go to high school, you would go to high school in your district. And what they did, they this school acted like a giant magnet school. They pulled all of the students who qualified to live there. Um, during high school, which I did, and you were given college-level um, classes, so that when you were finished, you were you were almost at a bachelor's level mm. when you went to university. Mm -hmm. and, and now I think in probably at least half of the states in North Carolina, there are schools like this. Okay, so um, you got off to a very sort of a fast track kind of a start. Yeah, you did, yeah. and you decided uh, uh, when that you wanted to get into journalism. It was probably when I was in um, when I was a teenager. When I was in high school. Um, I watched the evening news every night with my family. That was almost, um, uh, you know, our duty. We would watch the news before we had dinner together. And I remember watching Walter Cronkite, Frank Reynolds, Peter Jennings. These were these icons mm -hmm. of TV news at the, the time. The Titans. Yeah. yeah, the Titans. And I wanted to be, um, to do what they did. And You sat there at age what? Probably like, let's say 13 or 14, watching and thinking, wow, what they're doing is really exciting. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like a completely different world from that which I was living in at the time, mm -hmm. North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I wanted so badly to have that job, if nothing else, just as a way of jumping into other worlds and seeing how other people lived. Mm -hmm. And uh, w what would you say, um, you've come to live here in Germany. You've talked about the fact that you have a lot of time to work with on the journal when you're presenting the news here at DW, yeah? What's the ger is there a German approach to news that feeds into what you're doing there? Uh, um, there is a German approach to telling a story that I would say is very different from the, from the American or the Anglo-Saxon um, point. You know, we've talked about this many times. When Germans put a story together, lots of times they will start with, 
you know, once upon a time, there was so-and-so and so-and-so. And And then the the climax of the story, which is the actual news of the Uh day, Uh comes near the end of the story. Uh Whereas the American approach, the Anglo-Saxon approach, would be your most important information, your most exciting pictures are always at the beginning. Uh Um, And so that's something that you have to get your head around. They're not bad storytellers. Uh German journalists, Mm. they just have a different way of getting you to the information. I often have the feeling as well that German news moves at a different speed from, let's say, US news. Much slower. slower. Is that entirely, I mean, sometimes, you know, you and I have had controversial discussions about this in the past. I mean, I think it has its merits too. It does. Germans give themselves more time to think and to process what they're reading and what they're seeing and what they're hearing. In the United States, that does not even come into the calculus anymore. In the United States, what is paramount is getting the news, the information out first. It is very much survival of the fittest, competition, who gets to the finish line first, winner takes all. And in Germany, it's my, I, you know, I'm, you know, we could say it's almost a, 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 a level playing field here for yeah. journalists. Yeah. It's not so much about breaking the story, it's about telling the story that makes you a winner. Big difference, eh? Big yeah. difference. Let's talk about your, uh, your show, yeah, your new show that we've mentioned, Agenda. Yeah, we're going to, take a, uh, we're going to have a, fir- a glimpse of that now. Mm-hmm. And while we're doing so, perhaps you can tell us more. Okay. Yeah, here we go. Well, here we see the opening of the show. Um, Agenda is a completely new format on DW. Um, What I do is um, I set the agenda each week. We we have the show once a week, and I pick three stories that have caught my attention. And we invite people who are connected to that story in some way. They come on the show, and my job basically is to not only to dissect why they think the way they do, but also to challenge them and see if I can't put them on the hot seat. And what's interesting about this concept is that we've got three people sitting beside each other, completely unrelated to each other. But what we've discovered is that all of a sudden they start poking their nose into the other person's business and they're, they're not afraid to talk and you have this discussion with people who normally would never uh, cross paths. And um, we have 45 minutes for it and you'd be surprised at how fast 45 minutes go like that. Sounds good. I can tell you're excited. Um, you're going to be dealing with national issues and international. And when we're talking national, we're talking here obviously about Germany. Right. In this case, we're DW. Yeah? And you're going to be looking at international issues. Give, give our viewers an idea of sort of what are the, this is what's going on in Germany issues at the moment. Yeah, I mean, obviously there'll be stories that um, are, are very current. I mean, if there's something going on, for example, what's happened with the German president, obviously it, we might try to do a story there. But there are also some thematic issues that we're going to pick up on, this notion of foreigners in Germany, Germany's um, self-perception as a country of immigrants, that's something. Um, Germany as being the meister of Europe, um, you know, look at <laughs> the Eurozone crisis. subject, yeah, yeah. Because um, I know in Germany, Germans are very uncomfortable yeah. when you bring this topic up that Angela Merkel, Germany, is actually creating the new order of Europe. Mm -hmm. To even say that at a dinner party (laughs) here in Berlin raises a lot of eyebrows. But I want us to talk about that on the show because we are seeing a new order being created right in front of us and it has all of the handwriting of Germany on it. And I think it's important that we talk about that and be honest about what's happening. Great stuff, fascinating. Let's uh, do something a little bit more light-hearted just for okay. a second. Yeah, before we move on to, we're going to talk about U.S.-German relations and heavy stuff. Um, a little game we have, hand uh, hand on heart. Yeah? Okay. Well, we uh, you give me a you give me a number. Hand on yeah, okay. hand on heart, and I want an honest answer to the question that comes out. Give me a number between one and a hundred. Um, sixty-six. Sixty-six. Yeah. Sixty-six. Here we go. Are you ready? Um, were you ever really well? This is. Were you ever really proud of your country? Proud. We're talking about the U.S. in your case. Yeah. Um, yes. And what were you proud of? That's a, well, I mean, that's a good question. It's not one we think about every day. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to answer that living here, too, because um, Germans have a problem being proud of their country. And I, I grew up yeah. um, where it was, um, it was a given that everyone was proud of what the United States um, had achieved. And... People are proud of what the United States provides for its people. The, this American mythology, this ability to start as a dishwasher and become a millionaire. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I don't necessarily subscribe to that as, <laughs> as a lot of people do. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm proud of my country and the fact that it is a place where people from so many different backgrounds can come together, live together, work together. And for the most part, it works. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has its dysfunctions like any family does, yeah. but it works. Okay, so the myth of the melting pot that is very real too. It is, there is, there's a part of it. You know, it's like any, it's like a stereotype. We say, you know, you shouldn't think in stereotypes, but there's always a little bit of truth behind every stereotype. And yeah. um, the United States being a melting pot country, um, in many aspects, that melting pot does work. Yeah, great thing it is too. Okay, we're going to take a look. We're talking about the US here, Brent's pride in that. Uh, we're going to take a look now at the relationship between Berlin and Washington. Uh, and when we've done that, we'll, uh, we'll have a look at the, where the relationship can go next. An impressive new Volkswagen factory in Chattanooga, Tennessee, built as part of VW's goal of becoming the world's largest car maker. An ambitious widescreen goal in tune with the idea of the American dream. Heinrich Koelmann is one of the few Germans at the plant. He's responsible for turning VW's American dream into reality, capitalizing on the combination of German and American virtues. Think big. Thinking big is the overriding state of mind, but we have to remember our basic strengths, and those are born of a uniquely European and German mindset. In the end, it all comes back to a love of detail. Passion for detail. Modern relations between the two countries began in 1945. After helping rid Germany of Nazi tyranny, U.S. occupation in the West served as a bulwark against communist expansion, and America became a role model there. In a divided Germany, President John F. Kennedy made history with his visit to West Berlin shortly after the Berlin Wall was built. As a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner. For most Germans, the East-West conflict is a thing of the past. They identify America more with high-tech, fast food chains, and Hollywood. They're more likely to share an interest in Star Wars than in the Cold War. But despite many cultural similarities, differences have arisen as well. I think that what we're seeing is a move where Germany and the United States are adjusting to roles. And I feel that the United States is having to adjust to a role where it's not in the position to make as many demands, or for that matter, to issue commands. And Germany is gradually, I think, uh, learning about the need to accept responsibility for being the power that it now is. But Germany remains adamant it won't let itself be drawn into conflicts and won't always stand side by side with the U.S. Eight years ago, the then Chancellor Gerhard Schröder firmly denounced the Bush administration's determination to invade Iraq. It was a popular decision among Germans, but Washington was displeased. In the end, Bush and Schröder had little to say to each other. President Barack Obama and Chancellor Angela Merkel have also had their differences, despite making very public pronouncements to the contrary. The truth of the matter is, is that uh, the relationship not only between our two countries, but our two gov governments is outstanding. Projects like the Volkswagen assembly plant in Chattanooga are writing their own chapter in U.S.-German relations. Theirs is a small yet vital contribution to what's already an amazing story. Okay, Brent, I know you, you are on the German media quite a lot, you know, having, having the job of explaining US-German relations or explaining the US mm -hmm. to Germans. And I'd just like you, from your perspective, to explain a little bit, perhaps in your own words, how you see the relationship from 1945, the capitulation back then, through to the present day. Uh, I, I think it is an evolution that we have seen from a relationship parent-child relationship. That's an interesting image, yeah. Um, that evolved where you have Germany maturing into a democracy that is accepted and respected on the world scene to the point where you have um, the United States and Germany now um, seeing each other as, as equals. So Germany has, has reached adulthood. 
Yes, for a long time ago. Okay, yeah. so that, that we, we've got that far, but nevertheless, as we've seen, there are problems in the relationship mm. between the US and Germany at the moment. Yeah? How would you characterize those problems? Um, I mean, r right now, I don't think that, we certainly don't have anything um, like we had um, during the war in Iraq. Um, that is, that is, I, is something, thankfully, that we can put into the, into the history books. Um, what I see right now is tremendous, tremendous attempts by Washington and uh, Berlin to work together to solve the Eurozone crisis. Um, you know, if you watch what's being said um, on the international stage at any time, you see what was said in Davos, for example, at the World Economic Forum, the United States, Timothy Geithner, the um, Treasury Secretary, Angela Merkel, what she said, they're all trying to, to pull on the same rope with the same goal, and that is containing the Eurozone crisis and making sure it doesn't become a contagion. Um, it's total cooperation right now. Um, it's a completely different world than what we had seven, eight, nine years ago. Mm. Uh, obviously, the relationship between President Obama and Chancellor mm. Merkel is important in all this chemistry. And so we so had in that report, we had Obama saying that uh, the relationship between the two countries is outstanding. Mm. I'm not so sure that the relationship between Obama and Merkel is outstanding. Yeah, but we, and we love, you know, we're journalists. We love to talk about that relationship, don't mm. we? <laughs> I'm, um, I'm not so sure that it's that important. Ah. Because <laughs> but the beauty of having mature democracies is that the, the personality of the leader, while it is important for getting elected, mm -hmm. is not important for democratic processes to continue once that person has left office. Okay, point taken, but I'm going to interrupt you now, because certainly okay. very often Angela Merkel, who is a <clears throat> key player in the global economy at the moment, not, not just the European economy, she's viewed as something of a sphinx. And I know that you've given a lot of thought to Angela Merkel. I know you're a bit of a sort of a slightly reluctant fan, but you I are am. a fan. Yeah? I am. How, you know... Open her up to the world. Um, tell, tell us about her. You know, what intrigues me and irritates me at the same time is how quiet she is. There she is so German she can't help herself. Mm -hmm. An American politician, even the biggest statesman like Jimmy Carter, has never been as quiet about issues as Angela Merkel is right now. Yeah. We could argue she's at the pinnacle of her power right now. Mm -hmm. But she is opaque. She does not communicate. She's not the great communicator. And I, and I think the strength in her leadership is that she doesn't show leadership. She's quiet and she lets things happen and then she reacts accordingly. Sometimes I think maybe her reactions are muted and we don't even see them, but they're there. And it's irritating for people, for, for journalists, we mm -hmm. want to see action. Mm -hmm. And we don't always get to see that with Angela Merkel. Um, she's like a magician. I mean, she pulls a rabbit out of the hat and you don't, don't even see the hat. She's an, a, a fascinatingly skillful politician. Very amazing. Okay, let's, let's now sort of take two steps <clears throat> back from our roles as journalists, you and I. You and I have, we haven't crossed swords, but it is an advised metaphor in this instance in the past. We have talked a lot about Germany's reluctance to get involved in interventionist conflict. Yes, we have. We've talked about You're that You're very critical of that. Yeah. I am. I tend to have a little bit more <clears throat> understanding for Germany's reluctance. Yeah? It's Tell because, me about your point of view. Well, I think that reluctance is based on um, Germany's uh, you know, hyper-awareness of its history. And when I say its history, I'm talking about the Third Reich, Nazi Germany. And what you and I have often argued about um, is I think Germany is in a place now where it can look at its, its role in the world without the shackles of its Nazi history. It has atoned for, its, for the sins of its past, and it is a role model now on the global stage. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it has every right, perhaps every obligation, to get involved because what it brings to the table is um, something constructive, is something positive. It does have the capacity to be a leader, and why shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. It should. And Germans still, they, you know, they still shriek back. They're, they're, they're scared um, of taking on that responsibility. Um, mm. For me, it's frustrating. Although when you talk to the older generation here in Germany, I have a lot of uh, un, uh, sympathy for, for what they tell me about the profound, their profound knowledge of the suffering of war. And, and taking on leadership does not discount what happened in the past. Okay. If anything, I think taking on leadership and and affecting constructive change in the world is the best memorial to the things that happened in the past. Yeah. Um.
I just want to ask you this. You come from the southern states. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we, we're talking about Germany and the, and, and the US bolstering each other in mm. international relations. But certainly in the southern states, my feeling is very often that people there just look to Germany and think, irrelevant. Um, uh, you're, you know, the man on the street, you know what he knows about Germany? He knows Oktoberfest, he knows the Germans love beer, <laughs> um, and he knows the Germans build very good cars. I mean, all of the BMW and Mercedes plants that exist in the United States, where are you going to find them? In the southeastern United States. South Chattanooga. Chattanooga, um, South Carolina. I think there's one in Alabama or Mississippi. Yeah. Um, that's where the plants are. That's where the cars are made. So, yeah, you have that awareness, too. Um, but ha have you seen the movie The Help? No. Okay. It's a great book. The mm -hmm. movie's good, too. Mm -hmm. But it's um, a book and a movie about the plight of black maids in the U.S. Of south of the 1960s. Mm. Um, I grew up with a lot of with a lot of that, um, that, that, that racial constellation was the, around me. The movie, the, spoke, the movie spoke to you. It spoke to me, and um, I would recommend it as a way of understanding the isolation in which people in the U.S. South think. It's not necessarily something that they create because they want to have blinders. It is almost this, um, this natural progression that stems all the way back to antebellum America. What do we make of I mean, that? <laughs> odious and egregious are the two words that come to my mind. Well, the two words that come to my mind are pocket money. Yeah, isn't that ridiculous? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's interesting that this university um, leader, what was it, the, the vice provost, I, I didn't know, see his title. The, anyway, he's in charge of, yeah. of the curriculum there. He is saying that, um, he's assuming that someone would be a guest lecturer or a guest professor um, just because he wants to give back to the community. And therefore, it, based on this assumption, we can pay you less. Well, what about the students? How can I guarantee that my students are getting the best education? I can guarantee that by paying qualified people a good salary. Mm -hmm. I mean, that doesn't even come into his equation. Mm -hmm. And again, in this system where the students really aren't paying anything for their education, they are being left behind by the people making decisions. Should they be paying? Should they, should, should they, should they be? I mean, there are in various uh, states around Germany, federal states. There, there are fees, some yeah. tuitions, yeah, um, but they're still minimal, minimal. compared with a place like the U.S. or right. the U.K., yeah. Um, I certainly believe that it's human nature that when you invest in something, hoping to get something out of it, that you treat that good or that experience much, much more, um, you know, with more care mm -hmm. than you would if it were given to you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just human nature. Um, and I think that if students did have to come up with money for mm -hmm. their education, that um, when they would study in a, more quickly, they would not take as much time, and they would maybe be more goal-oriented with their education. I'm not saying it has to be like the, it is in the United States, but I don't think you're doing the students a service by giving everything to them by, with tax money. I don't think that's a service. The, the, there is sometimes, when you, when you go around a university campus here in, in Germany, there is a sense of sort of indifference, in, so, which is reflected in the actual facilities around right. you and the state that those facilities are in. Right. You, you've been working at the University of Hamburg. Yeah, so what it's I, like there. I mean, yeah. I, I can remember the first time when I was there was in, back in 1995, and I was appalled at the, at the condition the buildings were in. Um, you would have, you know, 100, 150 students come in and there would be a guest lecturer there and there was no motivation for, um, from the students or from the lecturer. This is sad. This uh, is it sad. Was, it was, it was yeah. depressing. And I thought, thank God you're not paying for this. If I were paying for this, I would go berserk. Mm -hmm. I would say, give me my money back. And this, the students, they're, they're not aware that they're being ripped off. Uh, it may be free, but they're getting nothing as well. They're being ripped off with every credit hour. Uh, I think things have improved, I have to say. The University of Hamburg now is a completely different place compared to 1995. Okay. Um, the experience there is much more rewarding. But the principles here are the same in that education should be free and we should get something for nothing.
OK, and when you talk about the US, you, you contrasted the German situation with the US, but we didn't, you weren't very explicit, yeah? Here's the chance <clears> to be so, yeah? Are we talking then about, you know, the, the, the Ivy League system and, the, and the, the, the way that, you know, the US has these sort of world-beating colleges, or are we talking about something broader there that is an alternative to Germany? Well, I mean, I mean the, the, in a broader sense, uh, y there is this notion that you have to invest in your education. Uh, there is this uh, this feeling that the education, my higher education, is going to be the most important investment of my life because once I graduate, that investment begins paying off and will do so until the day I die. That's a tremendous payoff. I mean, any investor is going to tell you, wow, you invested four or five years and this investment pays off for the next 50 years. That's a pretty good deal. Um, that paradigm is what's missing here mm -hmm. in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. Well, Brent, we learned at the uh, the beginning of that report that you need to be a Hollywood star to have a person. <laughs> right. You're not a Hollywood star. I'm not yeah. a Hollywood star, no. Well, you are a, you're, a, you're a new star. I'm a new star. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but I mean, I think having a personal trainer, it's one of the best investments I've ever made. Uh -huh. I've, I've had one now for over 10 years. And 10 years? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's not, I, I mean, you can see, I mean, I'm not uh, some bodybuilder. <laughs> but um, I mean, I'm incredibly lazy at the end of the day when I've You're worked not lazy. And, and, and I go to the gym. Uh -huh. I, I, you know, I, I just can't, sometimes I can't motivate myself and the trainer is there to make sure you can and it pays off. I mean. Okay, so the trainer is doing two things. That it's, it's motivation and fitness. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And he's so being paid. it's mental and physical. It's mental and physical and he's being mm -hmm. paid for that. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought when I first came to Berlin, um, I really thought I was the only person here who wanted the personal trainer. There, I, I just didn't know anyone who was doing it. And over the years, I've seen more and more people um, ask for a personal trainer, but it's still nothing like it is in the United States. I mean, the United States, people will cough up the money easily for a trainer. Mm -hmm. And here, there is still this apprehensiveness about spending money for a service mm -hmm. that benefits my, my physique. It's something here that still is, does not have a strong currency. But it is body and mind. It yeah? is body and mind. <laughs> and, you know, I would even go so far as to say that I am a better thinker. I'm a ah, better journalist. Now we're getting there. Now we're getting there. <laughs> because, I am, because I'm balanced. And the, the mm -hmm. uh, personal trainer helps me to be balanced. You know, the Greeks so, said so, it. Oh, go on. Yeah. You know, you have to have this body-mind balance. Yeah, yeah. And I really believe in that. You know, I, I had a personal trainer for two or three years. And? Until you, not too long ago. Why did yeah. you stop? Uh, long story. <laughs> the, the personal trainer was a squash trainer. Okay. I've played squash all my life, more yeah. or less, yeah? And at some stage I came to the conclusion I wasn't making any progress, and a guy who played top-level German squash said to me, we can train once a week. Sure. Yeah? And it was very interesting because you're talking about the motivational thing. I would go to a ball to play a ball in a certain way, and I'd stop. Well, he'd say, stop. And he'd say, just look at the angle that you've approached that situation from. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, that tells us a lot about who you are. Mm-hmm. And there's room for oh, a so different he's being approach. a therapist, a guru, too. A guru. Yeah, I mean, it's... It did me a lot of good. At least I kid myself it did. I uh -huh. think you get a lot for the money. I mean, they're not cheap. They're not um, cheap. I mean, I've just... Brent, I was doing... While I was listening to that report, I was <clears> doing the, uh, the math. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 60 euros for a personal trainer. Is that the sort of... I don't want to pry, but... The, because we had 4 euros 80 an hour for an academic. You see? And you see... 60 that, euros for the personal trainer. Right, that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. It's out of all proportion. <clears throat> it is. It's not. It's. It's completely out of whack. Um, mm. And I think sixty euros for a personal trainer is extremely expensive for Berlin. For Berlin. Um, I think in other German cities, it's it's spot on. Mm -hmm. And what I know from the U.S., what I know in New York, you know, is a hundred, hundred twenty-five dollars an hour. Talking of New York, yes. Take this in hand. Oh yeah, yes. <laughs> we like it's to ask our guests to bring along a possession that means something to them. This is what Brent has brought along. Very intriguing. Mm -hmm. It reveals so much. Well, um, I had to come up with a book. You know, I was told bring something that means something to you. And this book, a thousand and one reasons to love America. There you go. <laughs> there we see it. There it is, right there. Um, this book was given to me by a friend from Hamburg. Uh -huh. I guess it was about, it was 2004, 2005, and I was doing a lot in the German media um, explaining American foreign policy, why America was in Iraq. And you remember at that time, um, you, I, I and a lot of Americans felt like we had to be big apologists for what was going on 
And this friend of mine, she gave me this book. She found this book here in Germany. And she said, you know, if you get down on what's happening with your country, read this to remind yourself that you come from a great place. And I mean, if you, you know, you flip through, um, it does remind you that um, America has given birth to a lot of great things, obviously. <laughs> you know, cheerleader, so true, cheerleader. So right, He's right, proud of his country. Right, yeah. right. Uh, Brent, we've just got time for the quick quiz, the traditional quick quiz at the end of the programme. Let's okay. do it. Yeah, what do you prefer, reading the news or talking the talk? Talking the talk. Berlin, Washington, a special relationship or a strained relationship? A special relationship. Obama or Merkel for you? Uh -huh. Oh, yeah, that's a hard <laughs> one. But I think at the end of the day, I'd pick Obama. Okay. I would. Education. It should come with a fee or it should be free? It should come with a fee. Yeah, you made that pretty clear, didn't you? Mm. Yeah. You personally, what do you prefer, learning or teaching? Oh, I don't want to choose. <laughs> I think when I teach, I learn. That's the beauty of being with students. Ah, uh, very good. Elite or equality? Elite. Oh, the future of journalism, on air, on the page, or online? Online and on the air. There you have it, folks. <laughs> He's been a great guest, hasn't he? If you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, then do come back next week. Brent Goff. <laughs>